In section two, we're going to talk about who cares in a pandemic, the story of aging and long-term care in Canada. So we're going to focus here on the kinds of environments that older people live in later life, very briefly, and then focus on what the military saw and it, when they went into long-term care facilities in some provinces. And I want to put you to take a particular message from this discussion, and that is the link between the conditions of work and the conditions of care. We'll talk about what that means as we move on. But first, let's discuss the results of the poll that you took uh, between these two uh, sections of this particular class. So we know that about 5 million people in Canada are over the age of 65, according to the 2011 census. So in terms of the first question, what proportion of that population of people live in some kind of long-term care facility in, a, in Canada? The answer at the time of the census was 7.1%. So if you answered A in that first poll, that is the correct answer, 7.1%. And that population is divided between uh, about 4.5% who live in nursing homes, chronic care facilities, long-term care hospitals, which provide the heaviest levels of nursing care, the largest amounts of nursing care. So this would, would be where you'd be more likely to have very frail people, people with dementia, people with significant underlying health conditions. A smaller proportion of that group uh, in long-term care facilities, 2.6% live in what we call residences for seniors. Could be assisted living facilities, homes for the aged, seniors' homes. They're known by a number of names, often much less levels of nursing care provided in those particular settings. There's still a congregate setting, people are living together, but you, you'll certainly find a, a, a less frail population in those particular settings. So those kinds of numbers, you know, when you see, you look at those numbers and you realize most older people live in their own homes. How does that differ from what you expected? Was that a surprise to you? In my classes, when I teach the Sociology of Aging course in our department, a majority of students I find think that a significant majority of very elderly people live in institutional settings, far beyond the almost 30% recorded here. And they think that a sizable proportion of older people in general, that is over the age of 65, live in long-term care. Why do you think it is that we actually have that perception? Does it have something to do with the general invisibility of older people in our society, particularly of very elderly people in our society? We don't see them. We don't know where they are. Is ageism a factor, do you think, that we equate old age with frailty and decline? So they must all be in long-term care facilities? Is our society so age segregated that we have little occasion to interact with older people in our daily lives? So we don't actually know where they live. The bottom line is that most older people like you and me live in their own homes as part of the community. They do not live in institutional settings, but that population in institutional settings became a real focus of concern in COVID. As we've said, people in this, these settings have chronic illnesses, functional uh, disabilities, and need for long-term care, often dementia, as we have noted. Uh, we know that a small proportion at any one time live in these facilities, and I've listed here a few of the issues that face the, lo the long-term care sector in general in Canada. We'll come back to those in section three. One of the important things to recognize here is that even though in Canada today, we increasingly are moving away from a notion of institutional settings for older people. So we provide other kinds of services to people in their homes in order to prevent or delay them moving into long-term care. But that said, people have a higher risk of living in institutional settings in later life. They're women, they're very old, they live alone, and they're on low income because they don't have the capacity to purchase services at home that they may need. So some of the structural and social inequalities that we talk about elsewhere in this course are certainly relevant in this particular context. An alternative is living at home and a significant uh, 
proportion of older people in Canada receive what's called home care in the setting of their own home. It's an estimated 20%, the population 65 and above. We get a mix of public and private providers, etc. I'm not going to spend much time on this slide except to say this is an area where I've done considerable research over the last two decades and I thought some of you might be interested in a link here to a paper that I've written which focuses on the role of family and friends as a real backbone of home care so that when a worker comes into the home for an hour, an hour and a half, once or twice a week because that's often all home care uh, will provide uh, how family members intersect with, interact with, and share the care with uh, older people, with, with, with the workers who are providing services to older people. Common to both kinds of care, either at home or in institutional settings, is a marginalized labor force. And this is a key issue to consider in terms of what happened with COVID. The language of these workers, the names by which they're called, varies across Canada, varies from one province to another. Sometimes they're called home support workers, home care workers, personal support workers, home health aides. That makes it really difficult to collect national data on the profile of people working in this sector. These individuals are the lowest rung of a very hierarchical healthcare delivery system. Uh, these workers are frequently um, women, marginalized, racialized, immigrant women in many cases. That when we talk about casualized labor, in many cases at the beginning of a week, they don't even know how many hours of work they're going to get that week. That's a real challenge for them at constructing the rest of their lives. We know that in most areas of the country, they're underpaid. Actually, in British Columbia, in the, in the private sector, they actually do get a, 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 a better wage than in other parts of the country. But most of them have only part-time work. And because of the part-time work, they can't receive benefits. So workers cobble together a full-time job by working in one facility, some hours in one kind of care facility, some other hours in another care facility, sometimes filling in the gaps by working in the homes of individuals. So there's a real mix in terms of what they have to do to actually construct a livelihood for themselves. So this is where the quote by my sociology colleague, Pat Armstrong at York University becomes so important. She has written that the conditions of work are the conditions of care. And what we're recognizing here is that when we fail to value the labor of these care workers, which we fail to do when we don't pay them a decent wage, when we don't give them full-time work, when we try to ensure that, heaven forbid, that we should have to pay benefits to them, uh, unregulated, minimal training in some cases, minimal support, those conditions of their labor say a lot about the value that society puts on the care of older people and the work that they do. So how did this play into what happened in some parts of Canada? Well, we know very early on that as it became apparent, the learnings from other parts of the world, that nursing homes were a particular challenge in terms of sites of high levels of death associated with COVID. The very first outbreak in Canada, in British Columbia, was in a long-term care facility in Lynn Valley in North Vancouver. And to its credit, the government of British Columbia immediately recognized this with two policies. One was to restrict the movement of workers from one facility to another. And I've just said that's a common practice, labor practice that individuals have to have. But what they said was, you can't do that. You have to work in a single site because that way you're not transmitting the virus from one location to another. Secondly, in British Columbia, we sought to isolate and quarantine individuals who tested positive. That did not happen in many parts of Canada, or if it did happen, it happened very late. So you'll see a quote here from the National Post, four out of five COVID-19 deaths linked to seniors' homes or long-term care facilities. That says a lot about how Canada regards its, its uh, elders 
and the, and the weaknesses that it obviously conveyed in terms of the long-term care system overall. So we know that I say here, 81% of uh, COVID deaths were in long-term care facilities in Canada. At the time of my speaking to you today, it's actually 85%. Things got so bad uh, with workers being too ill to come into work or simply staying away for fear of getting uh, COVID themselves, and they don't earn a, enough of a wage to actually uh, call them in and have them uh, risk their lives for this. So a thousand military personnel in Ontario and Quebec were called in to essentially fill in the, 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 the backstop uh, in the system because of what was needed to actually support people in those long-term care facilities. And you may have read some of those accounts, absolutely horrific what the military reported. And I've listed over here on the right side of the slide, some of what they observed in terms of uh, the issues facing older people in those settings. Um, and I think it's also important to note, not only all of these issues, plus the issues of inadequate design, beds, uh, rooms with three and four beds to a room, shared bathrooms, the, the, no quarantine capacity, Nursing homes have known for years that they need to upgrade from that, from those, those kinds of arrangements in order to stem any kind of infection. That has not happened. And this time we didn't have family coming in to actually shore up the system and actually provide an alternative as they often do in supporting older people. So here you see from other parts of the world, some of the, uh, the headlines talking about older people in nursing facilities needing medicines and instead being given morphine and sedation. In other places, recognizing that older people in these settings died horrific deaths in silence and alone, often being treated by people in PPE and masks and unable to speak and communicate, them, communicate with them. How terrifying for someone with dementia who did not understand what was going on and why they were no longer seeing their family members. For other people who were outside long-term care facilities, for many older people, the collateral damage of all of the rules that were put in place to protect them from getting the virus was the loneliness and the isolation. They were in their own homes, in many cases, they rely on high levels of family and friend support and levels of depression and social isolation were well documented amongst this population. And this is in fact one reason that I put that particular um, a slide at the beginning of this class today showing a young child running to a um, iPhone image of an older person because for in many families, that was the only way they interacted with elders during this period of time. So as we see here in recognizing some of the headlines from around the world, the consequences of isolating older people, the questions about who actually cares for old, older people, um, these were systemic issues in Canada in relation to COVID and the care of older people. So in the next section, we will now talk about how we move forward from COVID. What are some of the ways in which we might address some of the systemic vulnerabilities that COVID so very clearly demonstrated in our older population?